Good afternoon. I'm Sharon Ivey, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Office of University Partnerships, and I'd very much like to welcome you to um, the third event in the Office of University Partnerships Empowerment Series, and this one is entitled Anchor Institutions Focus on the Future. And I'd just like to let everyone know that there will be a question and answer um, session at the end, and for those of you in the field, you can email your questions to anchor underscore institutions at hud.gov. And I've decided to keep this moving very rapidly um, because you have a very distinguished panel and they have an awful lot to say. As a matter of fact, they've already engaged in some very robust discussions upstairs, so I know that the discussions that we have here will be phenomenal. Um, at this point, I'd like to introduce my boss, um, Dr. Raphael Bostic, who is the Assistant Secretary for the Office of Policy Development and Research. Raphael. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Sharon, for uh, the introduction. Uh, it's good to see you all, and um, for those of you who are in uh, e-space, uh, cyberspace, uh, it's good to have you with us as well. Um, this is, uh, as Sharon said, uh, part of a series of seminars that, that the Office of University Partnerships has put together. And um, it is really important that we keep in mind as, as we do these that the Office of Policy Development and Research has a real interest in making sure that uh, people know what we know, people understand the interesting and important work that's being done uh, every day by practitioners trying to improve people's lives, and also that we've learned some lessons from those efforts that need to be uh, considered and incorporated into uh, our new policy thinking. It's, it's really important to do that. I have to give a, a, a real shout out to the Office of University Partnerships. Uh, one of the things I've tried to do during my time here at PDNR is encourage innovation and encourage folks to go and step up and, and if you have an idea, pursue it. And this was their idea. Uh, this was something that they came and said, we really want to do this. It's important that we talk about empowerment, how we um, make communities and people uh, uh, be in a position where they control their own destinies, where they have options and choices that are really important. And uh, I couldn't agree with that more. So I was, I was really pleased to, to have this uh, go off and very pleased to, to have uh, the work uh, produce such interesting and important conversations. So I want to thank you, Office of University Partnership, Sharon. You have a, a great team. Uh, the, the last thing I, I wanted to say before I get, get out of the way and we can cover the things that you want to really be here about is that um, I hope that you take the information that you hear today and you, you really use it. Uh, think about it in a, a significant way and think about how it should inform the work that you do, uh, how, you, how it informs how you talk about the issues and the problems, and how you think about what sort of potential there is for change. Today we're going to talk about a class of institutions um, that are present in just about every community in some way. Uh, and they engage communities in very particular ways. But I want us all to think about, are there new ways that they should be doing it? Are there different ways that could uh, play out uh, that might lead to different outcomes that change people's uh, lives and experiences? And um, you know, we're supposed to be the think tank of, of HUD. We're supposed to get people thinking, get those juices flowing. And um, I'm really excited for this because I think that's exactly what's gonna happen today. So um, I don't have much more to say on that other than thank you all panelists for coming. It's a, it's a, it's a pleasure to see a bunch of familiar faces, some new faces as well. Um, you guys are the front lines and uh, you really make a difference. And so I want to offer my tribute and thanks to you for all the work that you do. So thank you. Shari, I think we're going to turn it over to you. Or uh, Sharon, you're coming back up. Um, but anyway, enjoy the panel. And um, I will see you later on. All right, Sharon.
Thank you, Raphael. I would now like to introduce Sherry Garmais um, with the She's the Vice President, Urban Serving Universities, Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, Office of Urban Initiatives. Sure. Okay, thank you very much, Sharon. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I'm really happy to be moderating this panel. Um, as Sharon mentioned, we had a pretty fantastic, robust discussion earlier, so I think you're going to be really happy not only with what they say, but with the passion in which they say it. Um, not only have, has everyone on the panel um, able to talk about the issue, but they've lived it, they've breathed it. Um, they are uh, the people that we learn from in this field. Uh, what I'm going to be doing is I'll just give you a brief introduction of me for about a minute, <laughs> and then I'm going to introduce them because they're the people we really want to hear. My name is Sherry Garmise. I'm the Vice President for the Coalition of Urban Serving Universities and the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities. There are two separate organizations representing higher ed that are sort of committed to trying to help um, universities in this case, one of the, 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 the category of anchors, really move into assuming the anchoring role um, in, in their cities. And I'm very pleased to be able to help them work with that. And I'm very pleased today to introduce to you um, several of the people who, like I said, are really um, experienced in this field, who have made this field, who have defined this field, and will continue to do so over the years. So um, I'm going to read, read, read. You have the bios in your packet. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to do a quick summary of each, just so that um, the people out there can also hear. The first person we'll be hearing from is Dr. Ira Harkavy, who is the Associate Vice President and Founding Director of the Barbara and Edward Netter Center for Community Partnerships at the University of Pennsylvania. He's also Chair of the Anchor Institutions Task Force and the Coalition for Community Schools. Um, he's been Director of the Netter Center since 92 and helped develop service learning courses as well as participatory action research projects and involved creating assisted community schools in the local community of West Philadelphia. Um, also, Dr. Hargavy served as a consultant to the U.S. Department of, of HUD to help create the Office of University Partnerships, so I wanted to make sure that was on record. Um, I will be basically giving a history of the anchors and how we got to this stage and really setting the scene um, to embed the, the, the importance and the relevance of the case studies for you. After Ira, we're going to have Dr. Uh, Mr. Richard Cook, who is the director of the University of Maryland's Baltimore Social Work Community Outreach Service, which places graduate students as interns in community-based settings and demonstrates the contribution available to society by ignored and sig stigmatized groups. He also teaches research development, community organization, community practice, and has more than 40 years of experience working with rural, urban, grassroots organizations and coalitions in a variety of capacities. He's also um, in a leadership role on campus with two Community Outreach Partnership Centers grants that he received from the Office of University Partnerships. So following the, the case study of University of Maryland Baltimore, we're going to move to Howard University, and we're going to be hearing from Dr. Hassan Miner, who is the Senior Vice President at Howard, where he's responsible for um, strategic planning, university research, and external affairs. He's also the university's Chief Technology Officer and is, has responsibility for WHURFM, the Howard Commercial Radio Station, and WHUT-TV, their public television station. Um, he was named Computer World's Honors Laureate for developing a high-speed network that delivers telephony, email, internet, and tele television throughout the campus. And then finally, our last discussion is Dr. Henry Taylor um, from uh, University of Buffalo SUNY, and he's one of the nation's leading authorities on distressed urban communities and inner city development. A historian and urban planner, this internationally renowned scholar is a full professor of urban and regional planning at the University of Buffalo. He's also coordinator of the department's community development and urban management specialization and founding director of the University of Buffalo Center for Urban Studies, which is a research neighborhood planning and community development institute. Um, He's also received numerous awards for research and planning activities, and he's currently the planning coordinator for the HUD Buffalo Municipal Housing Authority's Choice Neighborhood Planning Initiative, and is writing a book on neighborhood development and city building in Cincinnati, Ohio. And with that, I'm going to move this to. Okay. 
First of all, I want to thank Shari, and I also want to thank APLU and USU and the Coalition for Community Schools and the Anchor Institutions uh, Task Force, as well and mostly uh, HUD's Office of University Partnerships for holding this event, which I view as incredibly significant and incredibly significant time to do this work. I also um, want to note that it's a pleasure to see the progress that's been made in the field. As we colleagues, many of us who've known each other a long time and some have just met, discuss what's happened over the years. And what I'm going to attempt to do at any rate is to discuss what's happened with anchor institutions. By no means is this really a history of anchor institutions working with community. It's a very brief history. So in 20 minutes, I'll try to do an overview. Start with two quotes, one quotation from uh, Benjamin Franklin and the other quotation from the Brown Brothers, because essentially anchor institutions stand at the nexus of the combination of service and the combination of service and economic development. Franklin's quote uh, is very significant because it was the first time anyone at a, at a higher educational institution emphasized or created a school for service that was non congregational, non-religious, non, uh, it was the first secular-based notion of service for higher education. He says, the idea of what is true merit should be often presented to youth, explained and impressed on their minds as consisting of an inclination, moral, joined with nobility, intellectual, to serve mankind, human beings, one's country, friends, and family, which ability to serve is the great aim and end of all learning. The purpose of higher education for Franklin was to develop in young people an inclination, moral joint, and ability to serve. And at the same period, and the same was true with Franklin, I could have found a quote from Franklin too to do this, higher educational institutions were created for economic development purposes. Building the colleges here will be the means of bringing great quantities of money into the place and thereby greatly increasing the markets for all kinds of, of the country's produce, and consequently increasing the value of a stage to which this town is a market. The Brown brothers distinctly, clearly, strongly talking about the economic motive of higher education as a place-based institution to improve the city of Providence, and actually Franklin said the same thing about Penn improving Philadelphia, the same orientation, this combination of service with the idea of economic development. And that notion, though, if one looks, we should move hopefully in one more moment. Let's see, I will try a different button. Let's see if this one does it. Yeah, there it goes. That if one looks at this idea, the core idea, the core idea was not place-based economic development, although it was key was the idea of service to the country, to the state, and the city. And that's not just the founding mission of colonial colleges. Again, initially religious institutions up to Franklin, so, and after um, Penn, other um, institutions were formed that were not based on religion and service. But the land-grant institutions, very significantly in the Morrill Act, emphasizing that their purpose was to improve the life of the farmer, to improve the life in what then were the expanding frontiers of America and fulfilling America's democratic mission. Most famous example of that, widely known, is the University of Wisconsin. And President Van Nuys said that the boundaries are the, of the university are the boundaries of the state. Or well, the boundaries of the state are the boundaries of the university. Helping to improve the life of the farmer, improve the quality of life. And the notion here was that academic work would be improved. In fact, there's a famous line when they asked Charles McCarthy, a great legislative librarian, who was one of the leaders of progressive reform, who was a good friend of, of President Van Nuys, who coined the term, actually, Wisconsin idea. They asked McCarthy, why did you have all these progressive reforms starting in the Midwest? He said it was a combination of soil and seminar. Life of the farmer with academic work. 
Then, in fact, if we look at this, we see urban research universities, starting with Johns Hopkins, the first modern American research university. We're not far from where we sit in the city of Baltimore. Daniel Coy Gilman get, says in his inaugural address, the purpose of Hopkins was to end misery among the poor, to increase honesty in politics, and honesty in business to improve the efficiency in business. Certainly, ending misery among the poor is something urban universities have not done and need to do more of. They've made progress, but this was a founding mission. It's the same in, in, in every one of these institutions so that the president of Columbia, Seth Lowe, who transformed Columbia University from a school, for, a third-rate school for preppy boys into a great university, said that the greatness of Columbia would be determined not only by the extent to which Columbia is part of New York, but that New York is part of Columbia. Founding mission of research universities, urban research universities. But what happens, my friends, in all these tales of development is the, the, the retreat from service and the city. That there was, in fact, a major event of, cas of in cataclysmic importance for universities, not just the world, which was World War I. World War I led to an extraordinary degree of disillusion, an extraordinary degree of sense that knowledge could not improve the world for the better, that the horror of the war to end all wars made people believe that progress was not going to be the result of knowledge and improving the world. So the Baconian ideal of knowledge for the relief of man's estate dating from the 17th century was suddenly dashed. And it wasn't only the lost generation occurring among writers and artists, but it also occurred in terms of universities. And there was a retreat into knowledge, as I say here, value-free scholarship and knowledge for its own sake. The purpose of learning, suddenly this idea that we study the world to change the world for the better. The knowledge was the key to making the world a better place. Suddenly it was value-free scholarship. We just study it because it's interesting. It's, it's something that academics do. And in fact, it was for its own sake. Jane Addams had a powerful quote at the turn of the 20th century when she criticized universities. And she said, when colleges moved from being religious institutions, again, Harvard being Congregationalist, William and Mary Anglican, to being more, um, there was a big change. She said, but before that, when people were just involved in religious evangelical crusades, they didn't count just the question of how holy they were, but how many people they turned to God. And when colleges turned from religion, she goes back to, and became secular, their goal should have been the alleviation of human suffering. Instead, they focused on knowledge for its own sake. A means has become an end. They have lost their way. They have lost their way. And the dismissing of local, so local becomes parochial. And what occurs is a focus on national and global. And suddenly local work, which was key to the start of the modern research university. University of Chicago became one of the greatest universities in the world because it focused on the problems of Chicago and its schooling system, particularly with John Dewey and others. Suddenly that became viewed as parochial work. And there's a very powerful book by Robert Nisbet, the conservative sociologist who talks about in his book, The Present Age, the 75-year war where the eyes were turned to global concerns. Excuse me, I'm jumping very fast. Let's see, here we go. The university in the city in the 1950s and 60s, there was in fact an attempt to re-engage. And that attempt to re-engage is famously known what occurred at the University of Chicago and Julian Levy and the Southeast Chicago Corporation because of violence in that community and other troubles. Levy took on the role of leading University of Chicago in partnership with others to improve its community. And there's certainly conflicted aspects to that. But the first phase was more participatory, generative, and Levy had a wonderful quote where he said that universities were in fact crucial to them to be engaged with their community. He said universities need to be 24-hour institutions. And he said what we don't need to become are institutions of scholarly commuters, where we meet each other in airports but not living in a 24-hour setting. We live and work better and we need a decent community. And then there was Paul Yuvisacker's 
speech in 1958 calling for the development of urban experiment stations and Robert Wood's plan for urban observatories. But just as Levy's plans were not enough because it was more physical and didn't engage the academic only and eventually became institutionally centric, not community centric as much as it could have in the second phase, the problem with Yuvasaka's work and any experiment station is cities are in agricultural areas, much more complicated. Couldn't use the model that was used for agrarian development out of land grants. And Wood's work was too scientistic. Urban observatory, studying the populations. And John Gardner, who is really one of the greatest figures in this field, the Secretary of Health and Education and Welfare, and the Ford Foundation put millions upon millions of dollars in this with little return. In fact, the Ford Foundation was a book by Peter Zanton called Not Well Advised, and he said what Robert Fra um, Thomas said, the head, Franklin Thomas, head of Ford said, after looking at all of this work, it reduced precious little. Why? Because it created urban studies that could be just as easily as in Florence as West Philadelphia. It wasn't place based to change the community. It was academic or institutionally centric. So although very important, and Gardner was very critical of universities, this did not move as it could have and should have. But then there were turning points. First, a perceived and it produced the beginnings of change. In the mid-80s, um, there was a sense of the me generation and the need to become more involved, of our st students to become more involved. And Campus Compact, which I'll refer to later, was formed by three university presidents, five eventually, focused on how do we engage students to become citizens. And universities had to do more. And actually, it was an early book by Ernest Boyer on the mission of higher education. It had no traction that he wrote with the uh, education editor of the Times but call for that same issue, but it begins. Very importantly, there was the end of the Cold War. Again, all the work had focused externally. The Cold War ends and the problems of our society become more visible. And linked to that was the urban decline, this chronic crisis, this terrible situation more and more apparent affecting universities. And part of that idea was what are universities doing to solve it. In the early 90s, there was a meeting when the, one of the leading congressmen in the United States from California, who was the head of a funding committee for NSF, whose name unfortunately now escapes me in my advancing age, said, what are universities doing with our current problems in society? And universities began to be called to, on that question. You can't just look abroad. What about the problems here and what are you doing to solve them? And then the intellectual case starts to be made by leaders. So Ernest Boyer in Scholarship Reconsidered talks about the need for a scholarship that wasn't just about discovery, but also was about integration and producing active change. And simultaneously, Derek Bach, in an extraordinarily important book, Universities in the Future of America, while he was leaving the presidency of Harvard, says that universities are not doing what they could and should, and in fact says if American, if everyone understands that higher education is the most important institution in an advanced society, what does it do? It educates leaders. What does it do? It's the center of new discoveries. What does it do? It's the center of advanced technology. What does it do? It's the leading cutting edge of education. Most important institution in the world. Why does America, particularly our cities, have such pressing problems? Call that question. And building the intellectual case that these colleagues and others did help move it forward. And then not just a sense of a civic crisis, but an increased emphasis and push on the need to educate undergraduates and the need for higher education to be concerned with citizenship overall. Our founding purpose from Penn and even the colonial colleges through the land grants through urban research universities. For America is to be a democracy, higher education has to take that leading role. And then we look at some of the changes that resulted in the late 80s and 90s, a turning points occur, and their programs and actions. I referred to the founding of Compact in, in 1985. And Compact's founding, as we'll see shortly, led to a tremendous organization of change in higher education. And the Corporation for National and Community Service and Learn and Serve America 
And the fact that there's a higher education section in the initial legislation, which I was fortunate enough to help draft and be part of, was crucial because higher education was seen as crucial to the issue of service and the engagement of academic components to service, the integration of research, teaching, service, and learning. And in 1994, and I'm not only saying this because I'm on home turf, this is as an objective historian, at least somewhat objective historian, that the, what HUD's role and the creation of, of the Office of University Partnerships in 1994, crucial turning points in programs. And this is a crucial point, I think, generally. You need to have centers of organization to begin to produce the change. This doesn't happen because people want it to. You need on-the-ground connect activity, but they need to be connected. And the government and other organizations need to catalyze, raise up those important activities and play an ongoing role. In the late 90s and early 2000s, there began to be a change of focus, but I want to make this clear. When I say change of focus, the economic and community development role of eds and meds and anchors, it, al it already existed. It just is how important it became. Because in 1994, in a very important essay that I also had the pleasure of being part of, the Secretary Cisneros did on universities and the urban challenge, he identified very strongly the economic and academic roles of higher education. So that idea was discussed and actually Rick Garrison at LaSalle University with a group of colleagues I worked with and a group in Philadelphia wrote the first piece in the early 90s on the role of eds and meds. But what begins to happen that's different in economic and community development and role of eds and anchor institutions is their actual activities on the ground. Because unless there are activities on the ground, exhortation is not sufficient enough. And my own institution and Yale Trinity, USC, among others, began to become very active in their local environments and communities. University of Buffalo is another example. We worked together, Henry Taylor and I, on those activities. And Wayne State began to become involved. And there was the Urban 13 out of a APLU when you were, not APLU, um, when, when you were nostalgic, were playing a key role. And they began more and more in the late 90s to have a few of them, not of the begin to show that their corporate and institutional engagement in their locality involving purchasing, hiring, procurement generally, involving their role as centers of bringing culture and arts and seeing themselves as place-based, putting in patient capital to produce longer-term changes. And then in the late 90s, the Eds and Meds term began to get great attraction. And again, something I worked on with colleagues on this issue of Eds and Meds, Cities, Hidden Assets, that Brookings published. And that term begins to be used. And then in, in, um, the, in about 2002, Michael Porter uses the term anchor institutions in a major report that begins to go beyond Eds and Meds to other rooted institutions in localities. And earlier than that, in the late 90s, the Casey Foundation talks about regs and eds and meds, regulatory agencies, utility agencies, electrical companies, and eds and meds. And then they expand their definition, building on that work, and develop an anchor portfolio in 2004 that indicates this work is important and needs to be grown. So the question is, what happens? And let's just look at an overview of some of the changes that occurred as a result of this. A colleague of mine, Matt Hartley, a colleague of mine, Matt Hartley, uh, in uh, the Penn, did a, 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 an article. And that article looked at a study of Campus Compact. And Compact was actually looking at the role of faculty in academically related service learning programs. Again, service learning, the, the idea of learning from service, academic work and service being connected in the classroom at its best, connecting research, teaching and service. And they found that 32,000, almost 33,000 faculty 
found that fully one in five taught service learning classes in the previous two years. And Matt, who's a, a professor of higher education, his study is the changing of higher educational organizations, said he can't think of another change that has moved as rapidly and as deeply and extensively as service learning of any other academic innovation since the founding of Hopkins in 1876. Now, it's certainly not sufficient, but knowing the slowness that higher education moves, you know, that famous old saw, the universities move with all the speed of a runaway glacier, given that that's the speed it moves with, this was tremendous change. And then we look at Campus Compact, founded with three universities in 1985, 1,300 members, approximately a quarter of all colleges and universities are involved in organizations explicitly engaged in issues of service and academic connection to that service and communities. And by 2006, over 200 higher eds had received COPSI grants, and we were talking about the impact that that program had with relatively small money, in fact, small money leveraging, catalyzing change, and with less money and with smaller grants, um, higher eds received 1,000 grants, higher ed institutions of the life of Learn and Serve. Unfortunately, both those programs no longer are as robust. In some cases, Learn and Serve really do not, does not exist, or it doesn't look like it will exist into the future. And what is the result of this work? Some of the organizational changes, and I want to leave with this as the conclusion. If you look at the past period of almost a decade of organizational and policy development, first the Coalition of Urban Serving Universities were formed in 2005 with an explicit urban serving mission that revived in a different way the earlier discussions that occurred among the Urban 13, and this was for regional, initially regional um, metropolitan institutions. Then in 2009, thanks to a report to Secretary Donovan on retooling HUD, I was asked to chair a group on anchor institutions, and we formed a task force in 2009 and did a report on anchor institutions and economic and community development. My dear colleague Henry Taylor served on that organization with me on the initial group, and thanks to interest, that report was very strong and received a great deal of interest. And that group began to form from that organization, not yet a formed group. And with, AP, with USU at the time, the Anchors Task Force beginning to form, we pushed the issue to create the role of higher eds within federal legislation. For that and other reasons, as you know, Choice Neighborhoods and Promise Neighborhoods initiatives, two very important in initiatives in the Obama administration include the role of eds and meds, and that occurred in 2009. And USU and APLU merged, or U as the Office of Urban Initiatives was created, and Shari was the first vice president of that, signifying a movement into the larger land grant sphere and among the most powerful institutions academically in the country. The Anchor Institutions Task Force formed, thanks significantly to the support of the Casey Foundation, and it was under the group MAGA Inc., an umbrella organization, and now has 135 members, policy task forces, over 35 presidents, without attempting to recruit. And significantly, organizationally, the Anchors Task Force, KUMU, the Coalition of Metropolitan Urban Serving Universities, USU, and APLU and ITF have all joined together in a cooperative partnership to push this work. The first time the entire compass of community colleges through research universities, including publics and privates, have joined together in a collaborative activity. And finally, this meeting. This meeting on anchor institutions focus on the future I take as another landmark, and it's a landmark because it is crucial that the partnership of higher education, eds and meds, and anchors together is a partnership with the government as a lead catalyst for change, a catalyst that provides resources to leverage the extraordinary talents and resources of anchor institutionally, particularly higher education, to improve American cities. And to conclude on this note, unless higher education, in particular, but anchors are involved in these efforts, neither will our cities be transformed, nor will our universities function at the level that they could and should, and America will not be able to re realize its democratic promise for all its citizens. Thank you very much.
I'm going to bring the discussion uh, into a more uh, locally focused uh, kind of uh, picture. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about where we came from in the uh, School of Social Work at the University of Maryland School of Social Work, uh, because it, it has lessons and sort of seeds for where we're going now and how we're going about it. Um, and then I'm going to talk about one of the things that we're doing with what we've learned and uh, how we're beginning to look at our own future. Um, <clears throat> I began work as director of the Social Work Community Outreach Service uh, at University of Maryland on the west side of downtown Baltimore in 1995. Uh, at that time, an Empowerment Zone uh, grant had just been awarded to Baltimore City, and much of the focus of the grant was on Baltimore's west side adjacent to the university. To say the communities that were included in this grant were hostile to the university would be an understatement. Uh, my staff working there had to endure daily threats to their person and property. Uh, in one case, I had to remove an experienced, talented organizer from one neighborhood because of credible threats, threats to her life. We, as the university, were seen as exploiters and invaders. But hostility to the university wasn't the only hostility among these neighborhoods. They were hostile to each other. They wouldn't work with or cross each other's turf lines. In early 1997, the president of the university lamented to me that he never saw neighborhood leaders in his boardroom. He only saw political and corporate leaders. I offered to get neighborhood leaders uh, together to meet with him on the condition that he would spring for lunch. Uh, so we got leaders from each of the empowerment zone village centers and the neighborhoods to meet with the president. And we learned that they wanted to continue meeting, not just because of the chance to meet with the university, uh, that was really our goal, but they really wanted to be able to meet with each other. And our holding a meeting in the president's office gave them a safe space to meet with each other and do what they couldn't do in their own communities. By our third meeting, we learned of the HUD uh, Office of University Partnerships COPSI grant as an opportunity. And I remember explaining to the group that was assembled that uh, the university, not the neighborhoods, were going to get the was going to get the money and that uh, we would be able to help provide services and more uh, work in the community, but it wasn't a grant that came to the community. The neighborhood leaders insisted that we apply for it. I had to ask why. Well, they said that it ensured that we would continue to meet with them and we would continue to engage their communities. Our first grant attempt was unsuccessful. Over the next year, we worked hard to uh, fully involve every neighborhood uh, and every school on campus in the uh, grant application. We were successful the following year, or so I thought. We are, we're informed of the grant award that we were and that we were supposed to be in St. Louis on the very next day to learn about the HUD requirements. So I went to St. Louis. Meanwhile, back at the ranch or back at the university, the newspapers had learned of uh, the COPSI award and they called the president's office for comment. The article that appeared in the Baltimore Sun said, the university received $400,000 to work with communities and that they were trying to figure out how to spend it. Well. The university president's office assured me that isn't what they said to the paper, but it didn't matter. By the time I got back from St. Louis, all of the neighborhoods were furious. And they said, all that work, all that investment, no mention of them, um, no mention of their carefully worked out plans. They'd been used again by the university. Distrust and hostility were back in full force. I remember calling HUD and asking about the procedures for returning a grant. 
Um, well, we identified a neutral mediator, and that person worked, was respected by the community, respected by the university, and worked to get the sides together to agree on a process for communication, and after six months of mediation, we were back on track. The COPSI grant, let's see, there should be one in between here. No, nope, it's not, okay. Um, the COPSI grant had extraordinary impact on the community and the university in lots of different ways, but I'm gonna really focus on three primary areas of impact. It helped us structure university community engagement. The grant required that the project activities be community-driven, not university-driven. Research or service ideas had to originate with the community. University ideas of how we were gonna help or what we were gonna find out were off the table. We were to act as a resource for, the, for community initiated ideas. This is a hard pill for academics to swallow because academics already know what's needed and what to do. But it allows the process to go forward with the community leaders feeling like and being partners in the process rather than being research subjects or service clients. Second, the grant required multidisciplinary work. Uh, universities frequently talk about doing multidisciplinary work, but they rarely do it. Uh, this grant required it, so it forced us to try it and learn how to do it. So we engage law students in helping incorporate community development corporations, medical students in doing health education, nursing students in providing a community health clinic. And finally, in this uh, helping us structure the engagement, the grant and its annual conferences reinforce the idea that this community engagement by university is not an event, nor is its duration tied to a grant. It's a long-term process. At the end of the grant, the community wants to know that the university partner will still be there. We developed a new appreciation of the idea of flexibility. Our grant originally talked about housing needs, but during the post-grant negotiations, the neighborhood leaders said nobody could even think about housing until the neighborhood people had decent jobs. And decent jobs, the only jobs that neighborhood people could get were entry-level jobs in the city. They paid less than seven bucks an hour. So we arranged a reverse commute program that took city residents, city job seekers to Howard County where the jobs were paying above $10 an hour. At its height, there were more than 100 city residents going to those higher paying jobs every day, and this brought more than 600,000 a year in additional income above what they would have gotten as at city jobs into the neighborhoods. We also learned a new appreciation for the possibilities of turning neighborhood hostility into neighborhood support. I mentioned the hostility in this one neighborhood. That neighborhood refused to let university faculty, staff, or students set foot in the neighborhood without prior neighborhood leader approval. I complained, I said, even to shop at your stores? Yes, absolutely. We want you to call us any time a member of your faculty or your students is gonna set foot in. Um, I called it the passport issue. The negotiated settlement we reached with the neighborhood leadership was that we, as part of this project, would only send students or faculty into the neighborhood upon the request by their leadership, and they tested us. They finally got around after uh, six months or so to asking for help in building a playground at a school in the neighborhood. We sent an organizer. The organizer mobilized the parents, teachers, and the community businesses. She got help from the neighborhood design center, um, and she helped the group organize to rain, raise funds, and they built the playground. Then I removed the organizer back to the university. Meanwhile, in 1999, 
uh, the staff at, at uh, Office of University Partnerships called us and said they wanted to do a site visit. Um, the staff, by the way, included a new staff member. I was frankly nervous about HUD visiting this particular neighborhood, and I hoped that uh, they would not respond to our request that we sent out to all the neighborhoods about the HUD visitors. All the neighborhoods responded, except this one. Um, I was relieved, and uh, so we met with the HUD staff in the president's office the morning of their visit, and guess what? The president got a telephone call from the neighborhood leader saying that they wanted the HUD staff to visit their neighborhood. I'm sure that uh, Kennard noticed my perspiration at that point, but we did visit, and uh, Kennard can tell you what, uh, what the neighborhood leaders told him. That, uh, she would not take the you know what off of uh, off of uh, off of uh, she wouldn't take the you know what off of off of uh, her that this man that, that this man Dick Cook has taken. <laughs> and as a result of going through that process, um, and as a result of interventions that were time limited, approved by neighborhood leadership, the neighborhood leadership shifted in its attitude towards the university. In 2002, that same neighborhood invited the university to develop a, a vacant city-owned plot of land in the neighborhood. That plot of land is now the University of Maryland Biopark. It was the community leaders who went before the city planning uh, board and the zoning boards to say this plot of land ought to be given to the university. So teaching a university how to work with a community is one outcome. Bringing additional income into the neighborhoods is another outcome. Changing community hostility towards the university and turning it into active support is a third. Not bad for a small grant. Let me mention post-COPSI results, I think most importantly involve our work with schools. Uh, we we're, are deeply engaged with schools. As a matter of fact, uh, one of our uh, uh, community schools coordinators is here, uh, Dante de Tablan. Uh, and uh, Dante is credited with helping save a neighborhood school, a neighborhood high school. Without his work, that school would be on the chopping block and be closed. Um, other alums of the process move into neighborhoods, buy houses, uh, fix them up, get jobs in the communities, and get on the board of their local neighborhood association. Let's see now. Um, what is now needed in Baltimore is that community-based organizations are calling us saying they're in deep trouble, they, they are dying. The resource pictures are changing, and there's staff turnover, and they're in deep trouble. So the thing I want to talk to you about where we're going, one of the directions, is uh, having to do with the goal of rebuilding community-based organizations. In, throughout its history, uh, Baltimore has been characterized by strong community-based organizations. Baltimore was first organized into semi-autonomous self-governing wards and neighborhoods. By the turn of the century, a Congress of Neighborhood Organizations um, was instrumental in, in securing paved streets and water uh, and sewage for the newly incorporated parts of the city. Uh, they also uh, got the tax rates held lower than the rest of the city in their negotiations. Over many years, Baltimore has become known as a city of neighborhoods. In 1970, 70, a city fair was dedicated to the celebration of Baltimore's neighborhoods. By the mid-70s, the uh, uh, head of the political science department at Johns Hopkins University, Matt Crenson, called the neighborhoods the nighttime government of Baltimore. Meanwhile, the city actually became very sophisticated in the use and how to work with neighborhoods. I remember that in my own neighborhood, there was a big issue uh, about sodium vapor lights, which were going to be a great tool in reducing crime. 
Our neighborhood, which had historic preservationists, uh, said, no, we don't want these, uh, you know, these sodium vapor lights. They'll ruin the character of our neighborhood. The mayor put sodium vapor lights on the major thoroughfare that led right up to our neighborhood. They stopped, started them again at the end of our neighborhood north. Our neighborhood became this dark place by comparison with the rest of the city. It took less than six months for the neighborhood leaders to change their name. But how many cities would have that level of sophistication about how to work it? Um, Baltimore's community organizations included much more than um, single neighborhood organizations. In many parts of the city, neighborhoods themselves formed umbrella organizations to address critical issues. Uh, in Northwest, the critical issue was the migration of African Americans into formerly Jewish neighborhoods. In Northeast Baltimore, uh, the critical issue was racial steering. In South West, ba Southeast Baltimore, it was a road that was going to go through and ruin the neighborhoods. And frankly, that road fight, which was led by, uh, by then graduate student of the University of Maryland School of Social Work uh, by the name of Barbara Mikulski, uh, gave her, her uh, a lot of her political uh, boost in Baltimore. Uh, but the community organizations represented even more than just these narrow uh, segments of geography. Uh, the Maryland Food Committee was formed in the city to address issues of hunger around the state. Action for the Homeless was formed to address the growing homeless population. Maryland Center for Community Development was to support the community development corporations. Um, thanks. And uh, HERO was developed to uh, combat the AIDS crisis. Over the past 10 to 15 years, nearly all of these organizations have disappeared along with countless others. And uh, while the demise of each organization is different, it's clear that so many disappearing in a short time span indicates that something's amiss in our support system for these grassroots organizations. One important reason that these organizations fail is that they universally pour all their time and energy and resources into their mission work and their program work. They don't spend anything on development of their organizational infrastructure. Um, there we go. The, that fact leads them incredibly vulnerable when a major change occurs, a leadership sh shift because a founding leader is retiring, or a shift in their constituent base because a neighborhood beca uh, became gentrified, or a shift in their sources of funds. So one of, one of the things that we're beginning to focus on is how do we help these organizations develop their own strength and capacity. We've taken this kind of approach. We uh, place graduate students in neighborhood-based organizations. They grow and strengthen the organization's constituency and greatly increase the staff capacity. We've also developed something known as the Resource Mentoring Project to assist community-based organizations to pay attention to strengthening their organizational capacity, not just their program or service capacity. And we've helped more than 100 organizations go through that process. In 2009, we launched Public Allies Maryland, an effort to connect young people to the nonprofit sector. This involves overcoming twin challenges. One is getting the young people to think about the nonprofit sector and public service as a career possibility. The other is getting the nonprofits to consider young people as assets. Public Allies provides this intensive leadership training, and uh, in the process, it's changing the face of nonprofits. Um, today, we are initiating ReServe. It's an age flip side of Public Allies. Uh, aiming at retiring professional and corporate workers at their point of retirement and trying to connect with them and get them to re-engage with public service and the nonprofit sector. And in the future, we are looking to 
uh, create initiatives around the development of leadership, including advancement of, advancement of inclusive and collaborative leadership practices in nonprofits, building a stronger case for return on investments and results uh, as a result of the nonprofit's work, identifying how to train leaders in core competencies and developing champion, champions across different generations. So now we're in the process of trying to figure out what are the leaks we need to plug. Uh, one of them has to do with uh, improving the funding base for community-based organizations, uh, developing uh, accessible operating grants. Another has to do with uh, getting funders uh, to think about how they can encourage community-based organizations to seek support from their own constituents, maybe with matching grants or uh, challenge grants. And we ought to be thinking about our universities for years have used endowments to continue and strengthen their work. Why don't we consider doing that for community-based organizations? We need to develop support systems for new executive directors. We need to uh, engage in formal training, and we ought to create systems for back office support. And there has to be a major public awareness campaign of the function and value that community-based organizations play in our society. We simply need to educate people all over again that democracy rests on the ability of citizens to organize and mobilize, and that these organizations serve a critical function in this mobilization. And so I hope during the question and answer uh, period, we engage around some of these issues. One of my uh, important areas of interest is how we see community people and the talents that they bring as resources that we can engage in this common struggle. Thank you. Stage, I, uh, I'm thinking about an event that happened that had to do with Dorothy Height. I was um, the Caribbean ambassadors every year give an award to someone for service, and uh, in the following year, the person that received the award is supposed to present it to the the next recipient, uh, President uh, H. Patrick Swigert, who was at the time president of Howard, received the award. Um, but the following year, he was out of the country, so I got to present the award to Bob Dole. And we were in the Willard Hotel downtown, and uh, the award was particularly complicated. It, was, it required both of us to use both of our hands to take it off the stage. Um, and behind us, uh, Dorothy Height was sitting, um, and a person who was head of the Chrysler uh, foundation, Dan Rabin's foundation. As Bob Dole and I walked off the stage, we heard this loud sound. The stage had collapsed. All the Caribbean flags had, Dorothy Height had disappeared, and all the Caribbean flags were on top of her. And so what, what, what was important uh, was um, I thought I will always be known as the person that killed Dorothy Height. Um, nothing else I had ever done would, would, be, uh, would ever be remembered. And, and uh, she told this story once to, uh, to my mother. Uh, she said, your, you know, your son almost killed me. And it was a very interesting thing. Uh, Howard University very close, was very close to Dorothy Height, so I didn't want to have that distinction. But they had apparently not nailed down the front part well enough and the rhythm, the harmonic we created when we stepped off the stage caused everybody to go back. When we went back there and pulled all the flags up, Dorothy Height was sitting just like this, just as calm as she could be. <laughs> it was like nothing had happened. She said, I learned how, 
how to take a fall during the civil rights movement. So, I mean, it was into, but I was, as I was walking up here and this thing was moving, I always think about that. <laughs> now, I'm an engineer by um, training and orientation, but I got into the urban planning area involuntarily. Uh, when I was a freshman in college, I will not name the place, I was um, called to the dean of students' office and given a letter. A copy of a letter they had sent to my home, which said that as of 6 p.m. that day, I was no longer allowed to be in the residence hall system. And I needed to give them 30 days notice if I intended to visit someone in the residence hall. Um, and what I was being given was the, the amount of money that went to room and board. I was being given that in cash, and I needed to find someplace else to go, to live. So uh, now I should say that they were justified in putting me out. I, I was not necessarily in sync with most of the rules that are necessary when people live together. Um, but what, that, what happened was I then became uh, I, I then began to see the university the way someone who lives next door to it but doesn't participate in it sees it. It's a, it's a very interesting thing when you do that. Um, many of the things that I thought were just fantastic didn't seem so fantastic when I was just a resident looking at the university. And um, so this started me um, in, in, with an interest in that. Um, Formally, I got involved in it uh, after, you know, when Ira was talking uh, about Columbia University, um, Archibald Cox did a study of Columbia University at their request about the town and gown relationship that Columbia University had with Morningside Heights. And his report suggested that it was a severely limiting factor on Columbia's ability to thrive, that hostility in, in the neighborhood. And so he comes back to Harvard, which was his university, where he was on the corporation and two of the other four people were former students of his. So the man had three, you know, three votes on the corporation. He, um, at Harvard, he realized as he went, came back to Harvard that there were four or five colleges at Harvard that were in the same situation as Columbia. One of them was the medical school. And so he was determined because he had that kind of influence. He was Archibald Cox, and Nixon should have known not to mess with him. Um, he was uh, determined to do something about it before it happened. And so he decided to hire um, five people who would report to him, and each of them would report to a dean. And I got the medical school, which was one of the um, uh, which was doing a lot of serious land banking in, in uh, Boston um, and for the hospital. They were planning to build a new uh, Peter Van Brigham, Robert Van Brigham hospital. And so they were just routinely just eating up land. And, and it, the way they did it was quite simple. Harvard would buy a, a home somewhere on a block. They'd tear it down. Um, the bankers would immediately stop providing any kind of additional assistance to anybody uh, who was in areas that, that Harvard wanted to take over. Um, so that's, that's, that's how I got into, involved in this professionally. And I came to Howard, which is the subject of this conversation about um, anchor, anchors. I came to Howard because I made the mistake of um, giving Franklin Jennifer a letter after he came to my house for a dinner party. And I, the letter said, you are going to Howard University. He was the first alumnus to be elected president of Howard. And I said, you are going to be not just the president of a university, you're going to be the CEO of the second largest black-owned corporation in the world. The first largest was TLC Beatrice, Reggie Lewis's company at that time. And, and because I had suggested that to him, he then thought that I should come down and help him. 
implement that CEO-ness. Um, and um, so I, I come to the LaJorette Park Initiative, which is the name we gave to an effort we did. And I should say uh, at the outset that uh, the Office of University Partnerships at HUD uh, funded many of the things that I'm going to talk about. Um, and um, and it, it, it's been quite a successful thing. Now, universities are fond of visiting problems at a distance. They really prefer to visit a problem far away. So in DC, if we're in Northwest, we would like to study Southeast, okay? Because we can visit Southeast, but we don't have to live there. And we can come back across the river and be nice over here. So um, I decided that when I came to Howard that we would take a one mile radius around the clock tower, which is the central part of Howard's campus over top of the library. And what we would do is, um, whatever we were going to do, we would do it right there. We would start there. Um, now, it turns out there are 151 blocks in that one mile radius around the clock tower. And, and so we began to do studies and figure out what was going on. And for the first year, I attended community meetings. Now, it's a very interesting thing when you're a vice president and you attend a community meeting when no person, uh, no officer has been to any community meetings for like 20 years when I went there. So in the beginning, there was just hostility. Um, and, um, but that, that, didn't, that didn't really phase me. Um, after about four months of me coming to these monthly meetings, people got the attitude that, well, you know, he, he's not going away. I mean, we've, we've been hostile to him, um, and he doesn't seem to get it. He must be slow. Um, and, and consequently, um, they started to uh, talk to me candidly about issues. And the university had, had a, uh, a sort of semi-well-deserved reputation of uh, not necessarily doing what they said they were going to do. And they were really being quite separate from the university. We would, we would cite a building so the back of it was facing the community. We would, um, you know, the, the impact on the community was not ever really factored into a decision we made. Now, I try to do two things now. I, um, first, I try to take the Hippocratic Oath, don't make it worse. Um, and then the other thing is, we look at alternative ways of doing something and try to pick the one that has the best collateral advantage in terms of the community. Now, we began by, we were the largest landlord of vacant and boarded up property in the area, okay? Our hospital, just like in Boston, was land banking. Um, and um, so we started, we began the work of, of uh, basically uh, making the decisions, what, did we really need all this land or not? Once we, it was clear we didn't really need it, um, we were able to put together a program, again, it began with, with uh, HUD money, um, in which we work with three CDCs to start to, to do, uh, to take these vacant and boarded up properties and build housing. Um, and um, we, unfortunately, before we started to do that, the neighbors had complained at one of those community meetings I went to that the, uh, that drug users and people were moving into these abandoned houses. We had the, the plywood up and they, you know, I, I, would, I would say, you know, that people would complain. And um, so I had to secure these buildings better. And unfortunately, before we made the decision to redo the houses, I secured all the buildings. I secured all the buildings to the point that we couldn't get in them to measure them when we wanted to redo them. Um, I put, instead, you know, most places would put plywood or something. They might paint it red, but it's plywood. I use cinder block. That's the kind of guy I am, you know. So then I had to, you know, get things that cut cinder block 
in order to get into the buildings, in order to be able to measure them so we could actually redo them. I got the Board of Trustees to agree to um, allow me to sell the homes at what it cost me to build them, not what they were worth. And we created a, a, um, a home ownership, thank you, a home ownership assistance program um, for our employees. And we counted as employees um, uh, people that worked at Howard, but we also counted firefighters, police officers, school teachers as Howard employees. And we put up, and one, one of the studies that we, we, we had showed that many of the people at the lower end of our uh, income uh, were paying rents higher than they would pay if they had mortgages. But what they didn't have was savings. So we put together a program using everything the city has, what HUD has, all those programs got bundled in a certain way. And we put $10,000 up at closing for these homes. And we forgave it if you stayed in the house five years. Um, and only one person has left that neighborhood in the last 10 years. Um, uh, so we did university-owned properties, we did the CDCs, and we, we also bought the, the Gage School and turned it into condominiums. Uh, the top picture is the same block, but for some reason, my staff, they think they're really cute. They give me the bottom picture facing in the other direction, so you can't really see it as nicely. But <laughs> that's U Street going from left to right, and that's U Street going from right to left, finished. Um, same, same street, um, and uh, am I doing it right? Okay, um, this is uh, Oakdale, and those houses sold for, because, of, because I had one construction contract, I was the developer, I had one construction contract. Those houses on Oakdale, which we did first, sold for $79,000, which is all it actually cost me to make them, to build them right at the point. Um, because they were going to university employees and community residents, the board was willing to not try to make money. What we wanted to do was have a stable community. Um, and these houses are at the bottom. You can see those. This is the Gage School on top, and this is the re redone Gage School, and that's one of the apartments inside the Gage School. The school had been closed for 27, 20, 27, did I go back the wrong way? 27 uh, years had been sitting there falling apart. If you think that a, if you think that schools aren't, aren't uh, well kept, imagine what a school that's been closed for 27 years is like. Um, so, but we were able to get it back. Um, on eight, the, uh, the second week of April next year, we will open the Howard Theater, also with HUD support and uh, these partners. Uh, the theater's been closed forever. Um, this is the theater. Um, this is how it looks when it, as it, as it's being finished. It's, it's on schedule. Um, one of the things I want to just briefly tell you about um, is we have a middle school. We're the only university in the area that sponsors a middle school. It's a middle school of mathematics and science. We have 300 DC residents, and this map shows where they come from. The wards are um, Arabic letters, and the numbers are. The red is the, is, are the wards. The darker the, the uh, color of the ward, the more low income it is. Um, we have a 94%, thank you, we have a 94% attendance rate, and we're like the most successful middle school in the city. Um, we don't provide any transportation. Um, and these kids, the kids, the 48 kids that live in Ward 8 get up very early to get here on the metro. Um, we start early, we go, and we do one thing that most people don't do, most schools don't do. Um, each of these kids has two computers. One's in school, stays in school. One stays at home with a printer. The parents have an account, they have an account. And, and uh, I was on this research board that, uh, that the founder of Apple, 
um, the co-founder of Apple, who just died, Steve Jobs, um, started for uh, chief technology officers at research universities. And I asked him, I said, look, I need a killer application for my school. And he said, there's one, but it's, but it's not gonna be in America for three years, and I'll be glad to call this guy. The program is called Study Wiz. He said, I'll be glad to call this guy and see um, if he'll talk to you. Well, Steve called him, and he flew here the next day. And so we, three years before, this program has our students send their homework every night to their teachers. So when you teach day two, you know who got what right on day one, okay? And you organize day two differently. You don't see that a child didn't get what you taught on day one on day five, okay? That doesn't work with math. You really gotta keep them up. You understand that on, on before you teach them the second class, you know who got it. So you call on the kids who you know got it, and that raises their self-esteem. And you don't call on the kids who are looking down because you know they didn't get it, and which sort of destroys their self-esteem. We're very proud of the school. Uh, uh, we just got our second charter. Um, we think it's one of the most important things we've done as far as community development. And uh, uh, you know, when we have questions, I'm sure I'm done. When we have questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. How's everybody today? It's a great pleasure to be here. It's always good to leave Buffalo and head to the southern part of America. <laughs> uh, at any rate, my name is Henry Lewis Taylor. I've not been accused of killing anything except bad ideas about how to grow and build neighborhoods and communities. Uh, this afternoon, to illustrate the importance of universities and other anchor institutions in rethinking, recreating, and redeveloping central cities and their distressed inner city neighborhoods, I'm going to share with you my experiences at the university at Buffalo. My presentation is going to be divided into three parts. Uh, the first part describes the university at Buffalo as an anchor institution, while the second part discusses some of the university's efforts to address the urgent social and economic problems facing the city of Buffalo. And in the third section, I'll explore some of the lessons learned and talk about ways that HUD and the federal government can bolster the involvement of universities and other anchor institutions in the revitalizations of central cities and their distressed neighborhoods. The term anchor institutions is both a descriptor of institutions that are rooted in the central city, and it is also a new way of thinking about the potential role that higher education and other place-based institutions can play in turning central cities and their distressed communities into great places to live, work, play, and raise a family. The University of Buffalo, then, is not just a flagship of the SUNY system, but it is also an anchor institution which is not likely to move from the city of Buffalo. The reason is this. With its 29,000 students, over 2,000 full and part-time faculty members, 175 buildings scattered across 1,500 acres of land located on a suburban and two central city campuses. The University of Buffalo is not going anywhere. It is rooted in the central city. As a result, UB and the city of Buffalo are trapped in a mutual web of, uh, in a tangled web of mutual interests, thereby fusing together their destinies. 
This mutuality of interest is very important because Buffalo is in trouble and it needs some help. It is a struggling central city that has lost over 55% of its population since 1950. Its flaccid economy has spawned a poverty rate of 30%, a male jobless rate of 40%, and its distressed neighborhoods, which are plagued with wicked socioeconomic problems, are struggling for survival and have generated the outmigration of a white middle class along with their black and Latino cohorts. As this city grows poorer and blacker, the problems become even more wicked, complex, and difficult to solve. In this challenging environment, the University of Buffalo is trying to realize its anchor institution destiny and its commitment to addressing the city's social and economic problems is best uh, expressed in the UB 2020 vision, which says, the building of a stronger UB is a means of creating more vibrant communities, providing more opportunities for young people, and revitalizing downtown Buffalo. To operationalize this civic strategy, UB has established several offices, centers, and programs with the specific responsibility of connecting the university to the city. Concurrently, the UB president has encouraged schools, departments, and centers across campus to craft programs and activities to address urgent social and economic issues facing the city and region. Within this framework of public service, UB is operationalizing its civic engagement strategy so that the resources and talents of the entire university are used to confront the issues facing the city and its distressed uh, uh, neighborhoods. For example, the Office of Civic Engagement and Public Policy Initiatives was established to encourage and incentivize faculty research on community issues and to encourage the development of service learning classes across the campus. To get the students involved in civic engagement activity, UB established the Civic Engagement Academy and the Center for Student Leadership and Community Engagement. These programs are charged with the responsibility of introducing students to the concept of civic engagement and in involving them in select community-based projects, typically as one-time events. For example, about two weeks ago, a group of 20 students worked with the UB Center for Urban Studies, which I direct, uh, on a one-day survey of residents of a distressed neighborhood. This activity was part of a community needs and asset assessment for the Bo Buffalo Choice Neighborhood uh, Planning Initiative, which is also funded by HUD. Although limited in scope and strategic focus, these activities nevertheless provide students with a good introduction to civic engagement as as well as provide neighborhood groups with strategic support of their projects and initiatives. The initiatives which I have been discussing deal mostly with faculty research and getting students involved in civic engagement projects. Now I want to explore one of the ways that UB is addressing the problem of underperforming public schools. To confront this issue, the university has established the Center for Education Collaboration to work closely with the Buffalo Public Schools. In this capacity, the center has helped the BPS set up its data management system and is currently playing an important role in leaking Buffalo's federally sponsored promise and choice neighborhood planning initiatives to the superintendent of schools and the board of education 
These relationships are extraordinarily important because they will facilitate the work of these two groups with the individual schools in the city of Buffalo. Moreover, within its facilitating and coordinating responsibilities, the center is also serving as the project manager for a 9.8 million NSF grant to improve science education in the Buffalo schools. Here the idea is to strengthen the teachers and to bolster pedagogy by working with science instructors on research projects during the summer and by adding interdisciplinary content to lessons and by focusing on problem solving experiments. The Buffalo School collaboration is led by a UB science professor and includes UB, Buffalo State College, and the Buffalo Museum of Science. On the adult education front, the University at Buffalo's Education Opportunity Center has established advanced training technology and information networking projects in several locations in the city. Now these are essentially computer labs that enable neighborhood residents, especially young adults, to learn computer skills and to get vocational training as well as to hunt for jobs and other opportunities. On the economic front, the university is engaged in several community-based activities. For example, it has established the Office of Economic Engagement to develop a strategy to provide employment opportunities for blacks and Latinos at UB, and to increase procurement opportunities among entrepreneurs of color. The organization is also working closely with St. John's Baptist Church, a black faith-based institution on a major inner city redevelopment project. UB is purchasing the McCarley Gardens, a 54-unit housing development from St. John's. Now, this real estate transaction is based on shared interests. The apartments are located on the Buffalo Niagara Medical Campus, which is the heart of the region's bioinformatics, medical research, and health sciences industry. UB wants to relocate its medical school on that campus, but to do this, it has to acquire the 15-acre site on which the McCarley Garden set. On the flip side, St. John's Church believes that it can leverage the sale of McCarley Gardens into a $500 million redevelopment project which will catalyze the regeneration of Buffalo's predominantly east side community which is located adjacent and surrounding the medical campus. To make this happen, the UB Office of Economic Engagement has formed a strategic alliance with St. John Baptist Church. Meanwhile, on the affordable housing front, the UB Law School has become a major force. Its affordable housing clinic has helped to produce 2,000 new or rehabilitated affordable housing units in western New York leveraging more than $165 million in private equity and loan money. On this point, uh, the law school's affordable housing clinic is also working very closely with the Buffalo Choice Neighborhood uh, Initiative in the implementation of its housing strategy. At this point, I want to shift the conversation to a discussion of the activities of my own unit, uh, the UB Center for Urban Studies. The goal of the Center for Urban Studies is to construct a neighborhood model which is capable of transforming distressed neighborhoods into great places to live, work, play, and raise a family. Within this framework, we believe that it is absolutely necessary to forge an interactive relationship between school reform and neighborhood development. Toward this end, the center engages in research and works on select neighborhood development projects across the region. And it is currently collaborating with the Buffalo Municipal Housing Authority on the Buffalo Choice Neighborhood Planning Initiative, which I mentioned earlier. 
The purpose of the Choice Neighborhood Strategy is to transform distressed neighborhoods into vibrant and nurturing communities of opportunity, which have the capacity to serve as platforms or springboards that will enable the residents to earn a living wage and provide children with the care and support needed to help them achieve academically, graduate from high school on time, and then go on to college or enter a meaningful career. Choice seeks to build these types of neighborhoods by implementing a comprehensive strategy that involves recreating and rebuilding the physical environment while simultaneously improving public schools, generating jobs and opportunities, and developing an innovative support service system to help people deal with the problems that confront them on the neighborhood front, thereby enabling them to take full advantage of available opportunities to improve their lives. In many respects, our participation in the Choice Neighborhood Planning Initiative is a direct outgrowth of our participation in the HUD Community Outreach Partnership Program, or the COPSI. In Buffalo, this place-based strategy laid the foundation upon which our future neighborhood development activities were based. The Buffalo Copsy centered on the implementation of an integrated housing, education, and economic development plan. The knowledge and insights that we gained from this program, combined with the deep partnerships developed with the Buffalo Municipal Housing Organization, the Community Action Organization of Erie County, and St. John's Baptist Church and three public schools paved the way for the successful choice application. Not only this, but it allowed us to upscale our work on Buffalo East Side. So now we have projects, we're working with projects in the Fruit Belt, in another major neighborhood, and when we combine that with the choice, we are literally engaged in community development activity across Buffalo's entire east side for the first time in that city's history. Now, before leaving, I want to stress that in the Buffalo context, HUD, and especially the Office of University Partnerships, has played a leading role in catalyzing our activities and in constructing an environment that has facilitated a culture of civic engagement within the University at Buffalo. In the remaining time, which I'm told is 35 minutes, <laughs> I want to briefly discuss uh, some of the most important lessons we have learned and within this context, I want to talk a little bit about what HUD and the federal government can do to strengthen the role of anchor institutions in the revitalization of the urban core. In my judgment, anchor institutions, especially higher eds, are key to the revitalization of many of the nation's central cities and distressed communities. Collectively, eds and meds, along with other anchors, including hospitals, cultural institutions, sports facilities, religious institutions, foundations, and some place-based businesses, have enormous human and physical capacity to use in addressing the problems of central cities and their distressed neighborhoods. But this is not going to happen automatically. We're not going to wake up one morning and find that anchor institutions have suddenly, spontaneously decided to do the right thing, unite, and work with others to confront this uh, wicked problem. That's going to happen only on television. Indeed, if left to their own volitions, most anchor institutions are not going to step outside their silos and unite with others to confront these uh, issues. The only way to realize the full potential of anchor institutions as generators of urban change is for a highly respected member of that genre 
to step forward and take the lead in galvanizing other anchors and to strategically focus their energies and strength on the revitalization of the urban core. This is where HUD comes in. It is the key federal agency charged with improving the quality of urban life. And consequently, I believe that HUD should advance an urban revitalization strategies that engage anchor institutions in collaborative partnerships aimed at recreating and redeveloping the central city and its distressed communities. Within this framework, Universities have the greatest potential for becoming that lead agent capable of galvanizing and getting other anchors to focus on urban redevelopment. Therefore, I believe as part of a broader anchor institution strategy, HUD should encourage universities to play a leading role in getting other anchors to tackle urban problems. Lastly, given the centrality of the university in advancing the urban revitalization through the involvement of anchor institutions, it is logical and sensible that the HUD Office of University Partnerships be given an enlarged role in the development and implementation of this strategy. Thank you. First of all, I, I want to uh, thank my colleagues, and I'm going to actually take some of their ideas and build on these wonderful presentations, and then we're going to lead into questions together. So let me see if I can draw out some of the least ideas I heard uh, that are important. The first, I think, one that comes across very strongly is the context of all of our cities, and I'm including Philadelphia. These cities are in the deepest form of distress, and that we face in our cities a crisis, profound human tragedy, but with great potential to change. Great potential to change. Buffalo. Washington, D.C., Baltimore, and Philly. Very similar profiles. And we represent, within our cities, radically different types of higher eds. HBCU, two very different state types of institutions, and a private institution existing within their cities and doing, in many ways, very similar and necessary things. And I'm an, I've been in this field a while. And when I come and I hear this, I cannot help but be heartened in the face of the difficulty. Heartened in the face of the difficulty because despite the profound nature and the nature of, quote, these wicked problems, there has been enormous degree of movement on the partner that is so crucial to getting it done, anchors in higher education. Not just the conceptualization, but in fact, there is action on the ground. But none of us, none of us, and none of our institutions have solved the problem. So among the powerful aspects of such a gathering is we learn. And it's only by learning and hearing and taking in those lessons in action that we're going to change. And just to take this further, and we talked about this earlier, the difficulty is profound. Uh, this isn't rocket science. It's harder than rocket science. Much harder, because it's multivariate, deeply historical, deeply embedded in histories of community, of race, of aspects of, of governmental university policies. And the other thing that comes through is we don't have a choice. We are there, and we have to act. The university I'm part of, the University of Pennsylvania, has had a relatively long history in this work, but it was sped up significantly when the problems of our urban environment intruded on the campus in terms of issues of safety, faculty and student recruitment. Now, it is true that alone will not produce good partnerships. 
Difficulties can result in good fences make angry neighbors. None of the colleagues here have been engaged in that process. It's working to make change occur, but we have to do it. Billion dollar physical plants, largest African American corporation, second largest in the United States, Buffalo's biggest employer, Philadelphia's biggest employer, higher eds dominate the landscape of Baltimore. We have to do it. And to do it though, what I learned from my colleagues, and I was fascinated by this, is all of them, both in pointing out what they've done and the need to what happens, is that they have to be comprehensive and multi-sided. The number of initiatives that were just described by Henry Taylor, the powerful example of a portfolio at Howard University that encompasses all these different aspects of strategic planning and five different aspects. The activities in Baltimore where we're seeing a focus on an activity of a long-term center reaching in more for more resources within the university and pushing it is a powerful example. And now to take a, something that wasn't discussed by all of them but was implied in some very strong, if we are comprehensive, if we are multi-sided, there has to be a combination long-term of academic and institutional. Institutional activity alone without engaging the enormous intellectual resources of students, faculty, and staff, be it from a community college through research universities, is absolutely not going to produce the change. Putting it positively, one of our great resources, perhaps our greatest resource beyond our physical presence in terms of economics, is our physical presence in terms of human resources. Human resources the ability to engage incredibly intelligent, incredibly creative, and not yet jaded often undergraduate students and graduate students, to engage faculty whose work itself will improve. So the idea is that we need is community engagement that is institutional, civic institutions, but with civic academic programs. In my own institution, that has been something we've been striving to move. I've been involved in this work again a very long time, since the mid-80s. I was seven years old when I began. And in pushing the university at that time, I was a prod prodigy. And in pushing the University of Pennsylvania on the issue of academic and community engagement, there has been not just my pushing, but others over the time and over a series of presidents. Now we have an institution which says its core mission is a pen compact, which has as three components, access, to poorer students, a lot more needs to be done. Integration of knowledge, but engagement local and global. And the president, when she announced that, said, all engagement begins locally. Think of the change from the turn of the Cold War University to that statement, and then indicates that Penn needs to become and is becoming, and she would claim it is, the civic ivy. But you can't be civic unless all your components work together. And what I heard from my colleagues is it benefits the institution. It is not civic just because we have to do it to be defensive. We will do it because we will be better academically, educating students for citizenship, providing a decent environment, and learning, and learning also from our community. And now I'm going to say something that I'll turn back to the first statement that I heard from everyone here. Not only do we have to do it, but who else is going to do it? Who else is going to be in that lead role except the anchor institutions? And this is an issue for the federal government writ large, which I will return to, unless there is catalyzing of the untapped talent of our communities and higher, educa inst higher educational institutions and other anchors in my judgment, and I heard this from every colleague, and, my, and Henry Taylor said this directly, unless those institutions are catalyzed, the American communities and cities will not be transformed. Who else has those resources? What we heard described of these great institutions with great traditions, producing great alums, with enormous resources intellectually in the past, but more important currently, they are going to be the key because this is such a difficult problem. They also have the economic resources, the combination of the service and the 
economic. Now, what does it take then? So now I've talked generally. What did I hear from each of these colleagues, from Hassan, from Dick, from Henry? And as I referred to now with Penn and the, the fortunate aspect we've had of extraordinary presidents from Sheldon Hackney, Judith Roden, and now Amy Gutman, you need leadership. You need leadership. You, I've known Henry Taylor for many years, for about 20 years now, and I know of his leadership and the leadership he's played within that institution. I've had the good fortune to work also with Howard over the years, and I know that given Hassan's position, that is a leadership role institutionally. That is a vice president who is taking on this. Dick is also a long veteran of this work, and his leadership and the movement of his institution in that direction is exemplary. You need the institutional leadership on the ground. You need faculty leadership. You need leadership of presidents or other administrators to move this forward. Um, Henry Taylor indicated anchors will not act just because they're there. Um, change occurs because people make change. Institutions do not move just to fulfill their mission. Institutions move because individuals push universities, push government to reach their institutions. America will not fulfill its democratic promise by citing the Declaration of Independence. It takes a Dr. King to say, we are not fulfilling our promise and we have to do it. It takes individuals within institutions and, go and catalysts to move things forward. There also the idea that came across, which I was pleased to hear because of the work I've been most engaged in with my colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania and around the country, is that there has been a deep recognition in Dick's recent work, in Hassan's discussion of the Math and Science Academy, in Henry's work around community development in schools, that schools are central for community development. That there needs to be a linkage of education and community engagement, of universities and schools, of schools and CBOs, of university schools and communities. And that in fact, you cannot have a separation of education and learning for children and adults. You cannot separate it from helping to assure a good quality of life physically and in terms of employment. And in my own work, and, as, and some of my colleagues have referred to it in their own institutions, a developing university-assisted community schools, where schools are hubs of neighborhood, not just my work, but the University of Pennsylvania and the Netter Center's work, open for extended hours for children and adults, centers of learning, centers of engagement, centers of training, centers of democracy, but where the young people learn, as Dr. Taylor emphasized, and has been emphasized by the other panelists, by Dr. Minor also, the students learn from active, exciting curriculum that involves them in active learning, in pedagogy that's not stale and dry, but alive, and at its best, in my judgment, is connected to the life of the community. And that universities, by connecting to that very same issue, can in fact develop in effect with the community pre-K to 20 educational pipelines or pathways where we learn by improving our environment. We learn by improving reading. We learn by improving STEM. What better idea for community development than advancing science, technology, and, and mathematics education in the community as a way of advancing economic development, community development, student and faculty learning, and students pre-K through 20. I also learned and this came across very clearly in all three talks, and it's true of Penn's history. You have to overcome history. The past is always present in the present. It's never dead. It's never dead. It's always alive. And the question is, how do you incorporate that history and move forward? And in case of my own institution, and I know a bit about some of the other institutions, we have not always been good neighbors. Penn had a history of quite the opposite. And when I was a young man with long hair, I led demonstrations against the University of Pennsylvania's behavior in that community, of moving communities out and rather than learning from them and including them. And often done with the best of intentions, we're going to fix that neighborhood and they're going to come to Penn. But did you ask them about fixing their neighborhood? Did you include them in fixing their neighborhood? 
And the issue now that's very crucial to this is you have to deal with that hostility. You know, the, the first law is you have to know there's going to be hostility and you have to deal with it. And I'll give you the second law. We heard this from Hassan, we heard this from uh, Dick, and I know Henry's experience. You got to be there. You have to be there. You have to be there and stay there. You know, that song by the Shirelles, right? That song from my youth, um, Will You Love Me Tomorrow? I'll tell you what the university's historic answer has been. I'll love you tomorrow, we'll love you tomorrow as long as we have a grant. <laughs> that ain't love. That's a quick affair. That is not love. And communities know it. Communities know it. And I'll tell you one other story. Many years ago, we started working in the 80s, a principal came over to me. His name was Dr. Velasquez. And he was the third principal at the school. And he was a very buttoned down guy. And he says, Dr. Harkavy, we're beginning to trust you. And I felt really good. And I said, you need to trust me because you know my youth. I was an activist. And he says, I'm from North Philly. I know nothing about your youth. Then I said, well, you need to trust me because we're working together and we get on. And Dr. Velasquez has a very different personality style than I did and do. He said, Dr. Harkavy, I work with you. You're not my friend. I realized I was in trouble. He was a principal. It was the time to leave. And I start walking out, and he says, stop, young man. I was a lot younger then. This is 1985. He says, stop, young man. And I turn around, and he says, academics come and study us for a year and leave us with worse problems than we had before. You've been here a year and a few weeks. We're beginning to trust you. Be there. You've got to be present and keep it and build it and do it. That's the second law. And then the third that came across, I think, in great um, clarity in Dick's um, presentation is the issue of democracy. All of them, all of them. But Dick focused on that as a theme. All of them touched on that. And I want to add, say in democracy, something I raised that was raised by my colleagues. You have to have a democratic purpose. The purpose cannot just be it's good for us. And I'm going to sound again back to that theme, to realize the, the democratic mission of higher education, to realize America's unfulfilled mission, unrealized mission of genuine democracy for everybody. You have to have a democratic purpose in the work. And that's why federal agencies in part are so important. Second, you need to have, and Dick highlighted this, a democratic process. And Henry's work, which I know deeply, has been involved in that. When I went to visit that work, it sung that song. And I've worked again with Howard, and I've seen the efforts over many years to develop those relationships. Democratic process means that the people you work with are not means to an end, but they're ends in themselves. Ends in themselves. You can't keep doing it if people see you as using them to get your goals or even to helping to build a good school. The process of relationships are key. And then the other part, which all of my colleagues highlighted, you have to have a democratic product. And what does that mean? It's not just change in the community. That's crucial. We talked about that earlier today. We always said the university has to change. Universities cannot be remain as they are, higher education from community colleges to research universities, if we're going to produce the change that's needed. And the change has to be mutual and democratic, meaning we are as much a subject. And if unit institutions don't change, then all you're doing is giving money where you shouldn't. Um, I shouldn't do this, but I will. I'm going to say something that I always repeat, and it's that what government needs to be doing, and other agencies, and Charles is here from uh, Annie Casey, is the NOAA principle. Universities should not get funded just because they're there. It has to be the principle of NOAA in the Bible. No more prizes for predicting rain, prizes only for building the arcs, for bringing about change. And the change has to be us too. Evaluations that only look at community buildings are not going to produce the change that's needed. So there has to be an evaluation that's democratic to two ends, community and university. In my judgment, school, community, and university. And I'm going to say, let conclude, and then we're opening this up. It is hard work. It is difficult to do. None of us, I believe and know, will ever claim we have solved the problem. I already referred to harder than rocket science. Let me take this further. John Dewey in 1927 had a book called The Public and His Problems. And in that book, 
He said, in fact, that the key to a good society was the development of democratic neighborly communities. And then he said, we don't have that in America or around the world because in the first instance, an intellectual problem, we don't know how to solve it. When Dewey said intellectual problem, he did not mean up in the air. He meant we don't know how to do it. What year is this? Let me do the math. That's 1927, so 2007, what? Help me out, is that 70, it's 80, we're up to 84 years. We don't have democratic neighborly community in Buffalo, in Washington, in Philadelphia, in Baltimore, in Istanbul. Name the country, in London. Name the country. And this is such a hard problem and we need absolute steadfastness and seriousness. And as far as my own institution has gone, and it has traveled beyond my wildest dreams uh, in, in this work, particularly in the recent period, even with all the good work that my colleagues have done and the, under the leadership of the president of Penn, we have such a long way to go in West Philadelphia. There are conditions there that are poverty levels that are low, worse than the lower ninth ward before Katrina. Look at the story Henry told, Hassan told, Dick told. Difficult to do, more needs to be done. And then the last two themes are the impact first of COPSI. Now, I'm, I'm not here as a kind of, even though I helped set up the Office of University Partnerships, I will do this now empirically. Certainly, look at the examples that were provided. In my own institution's case, I don't think we would have a Netter Center. We were a center before the COPSI grant, but if we didn't receive COPSI grants, and we received, I think, a number of them at Penn in different times, different levels, I don't think we would have a large Netter Center for community partnerships. Let me say it further, we wouldn't have. It provided legitimation. It provided direction. It provided resources. It provided a sense that we were doing important work. It was an imprimatur, and more than that, it helped build our infrastructure. And we learned from it. There are urban centers all over the country that aren't like the 1960s centers that Ford did with very important work, and the secretary of, that, that um, John Gardner did as secretary of HEW. These are urban centers that are doing urban work in their locality in their locality. So the OUP COPSI example has had tracks on the ground, both internally and in the community. I know my institution academically changed increasingly for that reason. I heard a similar story. Final point. Um, you know, I, building on the COPSI idea and, is that this is such a difficult problem. Higher eds have to move. And you really do need governmental partners across all levels of government, across all levels of government. You need governmental partners locally, state, and federal. And you need federal partners across multiple departments. HUD, education, labor, commerce, health and human services, transportation. There needs to be a way that that funding comes from federal, state, local to the locality, but also the way you bring it together in place, in place. And that in fact what government funds need to do is serve precisely as a catalyst and a leverage to get other, leverage other institutional energies. The program changes can come from the government funding, alone. Without it, it will not happen in my judgment. There has to be, government has to be a compassionate catalyst that utilizes its funds to tap the energies of communities and of institutions. And therefore, it becomes absolutely central that strategies are developed that integrate funding and program at the local level, like choice neighborhoods, promised neighborhoods, but more and more permanent. I'm not asking or, or, or pushing for, from what I heard, from what I heard from my colleagues, big funding. I didn't hear any of them say that. What they called for was the importance this funding has had, how with approbation from the government, that is, this is good work, and effective catalytic funding, change could occur, and it could occur long term if the funding catalyzes and continues and is sustained to move universities and communities. And then my last point, which goes back to an earlier one, that institutional, that governmental funding 
has, should entail helping universities to do a better job at their core mission and how community colleges and colleges and simultaneously help improve communities. It will not occur by just saying communities have to improve, universities you have to do that, it will create a counter reaction. It is that those funding need to leverage the enormous resources in those communities and at the universities and that fit the mission of community colleges, colleges and universities to educate our students for citizenship and to advance learning and knowledge to improve society and to improve the world. That's what I heard from my colleagues. Thank you very much. Well, I'd like to first start with thanking all of our panelists who did an absolutely splendid job. And then, and then what I want to do, obviously, since uh, one of the core themes uh, that we've been hearing is engagement, it's time to engage with you all. So the floor is now open for questions. For those, since it's being taped, I'm going to ask uh, anyone who has a question to walk up to the mic in the middle. In addition, for those of you out in cyberspace, uh, you can send your questions via email. As a reminder, the email address is anchor underscore institutions at hud.gov. And then I'll have uh, Kennard uh, on the side will be reading the questions to us. So if you've got. Thank you. Uh, Lisa Rawlings from University of Maryland Biopark. Many of you have talked about your initiatives as kind of a presidential directive on down or uh, certainly from the leadership, but how, have you done anything different to incent faculty? To incentivize faculty? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that that has occurred at, 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 at two levels. Uh, at, at one level, um, actually one of the things that happened with the, the, the COPSI grant was that we used a portion of those dollars uh, to create opportunities to encourage faculty members to become involved in research-based activities that f focus on these efforts and issues. And one of the things that we're currently doing in, in relationship to the Choice Neighborhood uh, Initiative is to try to find ways where we can see cross-fertilization with faculty members and try to get them interested in involvement around whatever the aspects of, the, of, of, of that neighborhood they're, they're interested in. Our philosophy is simply one of do what you do, but do it in a strategic mm. and, and highly focused uh, way and to use every opportunity that possibly presents itself in order to get faculty members interested. And the, the key is, at least from my point of view, there's not just one type of research that this work needs. As Ira continuously say, this is harder than rocket science, which means that these are extraordinarily complicated issues. So we have a faculty member that all they want to do is sit in a little dimly lit room in front of their computers and with archival stuff and do work. We said that's okay, but do what you do in a strategic fashion. If we have a health scientist that is only interested in complex health issues, we say that's okay, but do what you do, but can you do it in this area, in this neighborhood? Uh, so incentivizing means both monetary pieces but it also means within the framework of faculty members getting them to see that there is an opportunity for them to do this type of work in these kinds of neighborhoods and communities and also achieve their goal of getting high quality publications, national and international reputation, and for those who have tenure, those who don't have tenure to get tenure, and for those who do have tenure to get promotions. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, the COPSI grant was an initiator for us to engage faculty, and we used COPSI funds to do faculty buyouts, uh, course buyouts, so that uh, they could use that course buyout to do work in neighborhoods. Um, and then an interesting thing happened. Other faculty, as our school began recruiting, started noticing, and we began to attract new faculty as a result 
of what we were doing in communities. And that started sort of a culture shift. I have to say that when I started the COPSI, there were faculty I would not permit out into the community because it would destroy our relationship. They just didn't have the skills to engage in that way. That's not true anymore. There's been a complete culture shift, and the faculty are excited about the connections with the community, and so it's been a real culture change. And they use their courses now to get their students out into neighborhoods. It's no longer just sitting in a classroom for academic learning. Before, before we leave, this is, there's one point I really, really want to stress. In some quarters, there's a, there's a tendency that, 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 that uh, scholarship and work on these communities are, are, are unrelated. That's mythical. When we talk about the fact that these are among the most complex intellectual problems on the planet, it means that they cannot be solved without having the type of knowledge base that provides you with the insight uh, that you need in order to figure out practical solutions. Right. And so you have to find multiple ways to get scholars involved. And, not, and, and at another level, we believe that, that good teaching mm -hmm. flows from an actual real world interface and mm -hmm. interaction. And as we talked about earlier, if schools are bad, right, then what did we teach the students the, that went on to become the school teachers, the administrators, and others. That goes back to the university. You're mm -hmm. doing something wrong. If the cities are messed up, mm -hmm. then what's wrong with our planners? Mm -hmm. Why didn't, what is it that we're not teaching? So we have to look back, not just at the scholarship end, but we have to look back also at the way in which the teaching is unfolding because something is wrong and the university has to look at its relationship uh, to that. And that's why scholarship and faculty activities are so crucially interrelated to these issues and, and questions. Right. And we separate them right, that's right. at our own expense yeah. Yeah. and it becomes our tragedy as much as society. And I just want to echo that very briefly by saying I couldn't agree more with my colleagues and note that in our own work, we've actually had course development grants for faculty. We don't buy out time, but we give them money to change an existing course, not a lot of money, or to develop a new course. And we develop, we take a lot of colleagues to lunch. We eat and we talk about how they can apply their own work. I can't tell them. We have one of the great nutri nutritional anthropologists in the world and sociolinguists involved, and this is their core work. Well, I couldn't tell them how to do that, but working, and, and then we've tried to develop faculty conversations and seminars, and also encourage the faculty members to do what Henry says, write, publish, go to meetings, and create an environment with this excitement. We now have 60 courses and about 50 faculty a year teaching and about 1,600 undergraduates and graduates only focusing academically on West Philadelphia. That's because the faculty believe in the work and are moving it forward. And the incentive is community, is lunch, and is uh, also having these small course development funds and so on. Okay, let me right. go to the next question, please. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Bernard Moore, and I'm a HUD employee. Uh, my question primarily uh, is addressed to uh, Dr. M Minor. Uh, with respect to historical black colleges and universities, to what degree is the Howard model being replicated at other HBCUs that are in fact in other, that are in fact in distressed areas? I mean, some of the challenges that they, one of the challenges that many HBCUs face is remaining anchor institutions themselves. Thank you. Right, you're, you're right. Uh, but it was at HUD that uh, when one of our former trustees, Jack Kemp, was secretary here, that uh, he called a meeting of all 105 HBCUs uh, presidents. And, and out of that came uh, a focus on realizing that many of them could be important anchors in their uh, communities. And, and, and some of them have, have, have carried that on. There were grants, and initially it was in the discretionary 
money in the secretary's office, but it later became a, a, a program, uh, a separate kind of program. And I was sort of disappointed because I helped to, to develop it, but then I couldn't get any of the grants. I'm saying, how's that possible? I mean, I know the criteria really well. Uh, but but there are, are several. But I'll tell you something. I think um, there's going to come a time when we have to look at this thing as uh, putting the kind of strategic partnerships across HBCUs. Hmm. Um, uh, if you think about it, given what we can do in distance learning, I worked with the Western Governors on creating a Western Governors University, right? Um, and basically they were saying, we don't have the money to do what California did. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can't do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, California couldn't do it again, mm -hmm. okay? But what we can do is we can get together and create something which shares certain resources and play it. I think HBCUs are going to have to do that. Um, and I think when they do that, and I'll tell you the story, you know, when I, the thing that always struck me about MIT, which was different from other universities that, that I had, had been at, um, all the former presidents that were alive had offices on the same level as the president. And, and some places try to expunge mm. the history of somebody that went before. But what they did at MIT was each of those presidents had a Rolodex and a group of people that they were uniquely connected to. Mm -hmm. And so what the new president would do was they became his ambassadors to the, or and now her ambassador to those constituencies. Um, and so yeah, you might have retired as president, but you still had that special relationship and they use it. And I think we have That's to start cool. to do that as well. And so I think the potential is there. Um, I think that uh, the threat to us, I mean, the most dangerous thing in a democracy is the failed school system. Mm -hmm. To me, all the shared values that are the glue that makes us want to keep covenants that our parents and grandparents mm -hmm. made, that's way more dangerous than any weapon system anybody's building. Okay, because that's the glue. Home ownership and a, a great public uh, system going all the way through City College, all of those things, those were things that made us unique and those were things that made us so that you couldn't tell what a child would be by knowing what their parents were. That mobility was critical and I still think it's critical and so I think this is at a time where all of higher education, and I think it's starting to happen, all of higher education has to be uh, connected and has to be looking for strategic opportunities to work together, not to talk about working together, to work together. Mm -hmm. And then it'll happen, I, I believe. Okay, let me just, uh, I was asked to make an announcement before I take the next question. Um, and I know that the people are starting to leave, but there are a number of publications that are available in the back at the two tables if um, when we're all done, you wanna quickly take a look. And with that, the next question, please. Um, hello, my name is Kate Heiser, and I'm here with the Philadelphia Foundation. We're a 100-year-old community foundation, mm -hmm. um, so we're sort of like a really tiny anchor. Uh, my question is, um, if any of you have thoughts about a role that place-based philanthropy uh, might have in your work, since we can sometimes be more nimble, um, but certainly not as well-resourced. Definitely. <laughs> One is... Uh, Make sure that your grants are tied to encouraging the grantees to secure uh, involvement, support, maybe even some kind of matching kind of support from the communities where they're working in. Uh, it, it's just an enormously powerful tool, and if it's just a grant, that builds no infrastructure and goes away, it makes all of the same mistakes that all these other failed good programs, but they have no legs. So that, I think that's one of the most important ones. And through doing that, encourage a discussion about what resources really mean and where resources come from. And I'll do a, my quick story of some local resources. We had a <clears throat> social worker that came to me during the time of the COPSI grant. Her uh, 
Her son was going from elementary school to a middle school. The middle school had a serious drug problem in it, and she was terrified. And yet, in her work life, she worked in a nursing home. In the nursing home, there were two guys who were at the end of their lives as a result of substance abuse, lying on gurneys. They were quadriplegic. They wanted nothing more at the end of their lives than a chance to talk to young people about what the mistakes were that they made. So we arranged some school visits. If two dying drug users are resources to our community that are in some ways more valuable than 100 lectures from their teachers about the evils of substance abuse, just think about the resources that we're ignoring every single day in every one of our communities. It's just enormously powerful. And our job is to figure out how to liberate those resources. Uh, just one thought on that is, uh, in my view, the most powerful projects are those that are, are centered around neighborhoods and communities where work is undertaken. And a lot of times, uh, with many of the activities that we are involved in, including my own university, you have projects going on all over the city without any thoughts about projects that are really place-based, where you have an opportunity to work comprehensively to actually change and, and develop an entire community. If there's anything I would say is that there ought to be lines of support that are strategically tied to places where activities are occurring in a systematic way, rather than to just projects that are randomly distributed across the face of the city. Because all those projects that are randomly distributed across the city, unless they're tied and connected to place, they will not have a synergistic and transforming uh, impact on the lives of people. Mm -hmm. The, the only thing I would just add is we've actually worked with community foundations around the country. We, you guys also, in our early youth, as a project in the 80s, funded us, so thank you. But, but more generally, um, we have money to replicate our work around the country thanks to an endowment. We develop regional centers around university-assisted community schools. I've worked at University of Oklahoma, Tulsa, and now Indianapolis University, Purdue University, and Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis. And we require a local match and the community foundations have stepped up to the plate. They're the ones who step up to the plate. They understand. So even if they're not the only ones who step up to the plate, they're crucial, catalytic in this case, to say, this, we care about this in our community. So I think that strategy, that is place-based, that's institutional buy-in is providing an imprimatur. So that's what I do. Hi, my name is Loring Ressler. I'm from the Maryland Institute and College of Art. Mm -hmm. um, I am very grateful to Dante de Blatton for inviting me at the last minute to join him here. I'm skipping school. Um, <laughs> but I'm privileged to be here. And I thank you all for the conversation that you've provided us with. I have a gazillion questions as a result, and I'm going to try to limit it to one based on my own experience. Um, I'm privileged to work with Dante by engaging my students in some after-school work there. I chose to do so because I train teachers, and my teachers were afraid to work within an urban context, and I felt that it was crucial that they have this experience, as that was how I gained my experience towards doctoral studies. That being said, and in listening to all of you, I couldn't agree more. I, I am thrilled to hear that everyone is on board with engaging in this process of transformation. Um, I'm particularly touched by your um, notion of mutuality, Dr. Taylor. And yet, it seems to me that we are all people of privilege. And we recognize the necessity of developing capacity. And what I would like to hear any or all of you speak to is the methods of engagement by which we develop our own awareness towards understanding the inherent 
capacities, behaviors, characteristics, and psychologies of community towards really developing mutuality. Well, I, I would say, um, for me, the year I spent going to meetings not uh, mostly listening, um, I would also say that what I have found, fortunately, uh, genius doesn't always follow. I mean, I used to have this joke about if you follow a, uh, a, a, a child with a certain characteristic home, you'll find a parent with that characteristic opening the door at the end of school. But what I would say is that um, the talent, and in many cases, in, in my work, uh, in the 151 block area that I was you know, talking about for the George Park Initiative, the, the ideas came there. I agree. You know, and, and, and it was a willingness. We, we, we could supplement sometimes, um, but um, it wasn't a surprise to me that the people who understood the situation the most had a better fix on um, what were the right solutions to employ. Um, but there was a role for the university, a genuine role. But I, I'm simply saying that without the real relationship, we would have developed strategies that didn't hit the mark. I, I completely agree. I, maybe I need to rephrase my question a little bit. But in I my, could have just misunderstood. Well, I may not have gotten to the point, because I have so much in my head that I'd like to ask all of you. Um, but it seems that the community has distinct um, behaviors and characteristics and ways of knowing that can inform mm -hmm. institutional education. Sure. And I'm wondering, I've got my own ideas in listening to all of you, but I'm wondering if, if you can speak to what you might see as some of those behaviors and characteristics of community that inform and transform university. Because you're right, universities have to change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, me, I think that's more specific. Let me give you one example. I, I mean, I think that as conditions have, at least in our own context and what I see about a lot of other places, as, as conditions have, have worsened in, in urban centers, issues and questions that impact both universities and, and communities has created uh, the opportunities for a dialogue. And a, a challenge is how, within the framework of that dialogue, uh, do you figure out what the real dynamics are that are occurring inside of neighborhoods and communities, and how does that get back? across the board to where the kids, the, uh, the university is. L let me give you one example from my own experience regarding schools. I've, I've been struck when we were working with schools and how many, how few educators and policy makers ever talk to the children. And much of what you read is from what people have said about occurring with, with the kids. Uh, and I'll, project uh, where we're working with, with uh, the schools, we wanted to do not to make that same mistake. So we spent a lot of time just talking to kids. And we, some interesting things came out that were insightful to us. One, that most of the kids felt that the people in their neighborhoods, and especially the people, their primary caregivers, were loving and supportive, which tended to run counter to the literature they felt that the vast majority of their teachers simply did not care, that the vast majority of the principals and administrators did not care. But then we talked more deeply. Most of them had no quiet place to study at home. Most of them within the framework of their neighborhoods had no quiet place to study. Most of them had no computers, and those who did have computers did not have access <coughs> to the, the internet. So right away, just at that level, there were structural issues, both at the house and structural issues inside of neighborhoods with no libraries, no places to study, no places to get homework assistance and support. 
The after school programs traditionally are very poorly attended. If you've got 200 kids in an after school program and 500 kids in the school, I mean, you're still not even beginning to touch it. Most folks didn't have those things. So there were structural, deep structural issues involved. The transportation systems took kids, the passes they, they got, took them from school to home to school. The transportation passes would not allow them to go to other locations and places for educational purposes, libraries, museums, computer labs. So there were, there were fundamental structural issues that we knew we would have to transform in order to, to impact. We also discovered that very few teachers know anything at all about the lives of these kids. They never visit the neighborhood. The only thing that they just don't know. So as a result of the fact that many of the teachers simply don't know anything about the kids, they view the kids through deficit lenses. So when the kids say something insightful, they're surprised. <laughs> wow, you know about property values? Or often they will see kids and just based on visual things make perceptions. Like I've heard teachers, by way of my agents, and those will be our students, have heard teachers refer to students in the seventh and eighth grade that they believe are high-priced prostitutes because of the relationship between elite men in the area visiting these neighborhoods and developing long-term relationships for sexual reasons. The teachers say that matter-of-factly, matter-of-factly. So the, 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 the point I'm making is, is simply that if we could get this kind of information into academic-based programs within the framework of the colleges and the universities, these are the things they ought to be teaching these youngsters and principals who would be going back into the schools so that they would have this kind of understanding that every education school in the country at the, at the collegiate level ought to have a deep urban education program where field work, not only in the school, but field work in the neighborhoods and the communities where the people live ought to be a requirement. Okay, we've got barely time for the last question, so I'm gonna ask you to be quick and I'm gonna ask uh, the answers to be quick. Hi, my name is Andrew Shoneman and I'm a doctoral student in the School of Social Work in, uh, at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond. And through a project I did recently looking at um, community engagement across different disciplines, uh, one of the things that I found, and then through talking to people as well, is that the term is actually defined differently. And so when you hear, as a couple of you mentioned, that universities are trying to get people to work across disciplines, that just seems like a, a pretty basic uh, barrier to, to making that happen. And then the other thing that's, I think, related is that the higher ed folks, so the administrations at the universities, are maybe talking a different language than the folks in the specific disciplines. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you think that that carries any weight, and if so, if you have any ideas about how maybe to address some of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. just, just sort of uh, repeat what several people already said, that. You're absolutely right. It, it is a tremendous challenge, um, and the way to overcome the challenge is to start doing it. That's right. Get people, pick a community issue that is burning, mm -hmm. and get place. people from the different schools, the different disciplines to sit down together and say, with some community leaders represented, and say, how are we going to work together to do this? It changes the whole dynamic. You know the the academic language, the people, the academics start to realize, can't talk that way. They won't understand me. The whole dynamic changes. Mm -hmm. You see, the, the best way to create interdisciplinarity is to work together on a complex problem with the community in place, as Dick said, in a place. 
because he's a, as all my colleagues indicated, these are such wicked, using Henry's term, problems, so complex, so difficult, we only can solve it if we do it together. And it won't happen in faculty seminars. The OECD had a report in 1983 called Universities in the Community, and he said, communities have problems, universities have departments and schools. <laughs> the question is to take those problems and have that be the center of learning, but not out there, with the community on the ground. That's how you create interdisciplinary and better scholarship. I, I, I would say we've been using uh, political arithmetic. We need at least algebra and perhaps even calculus for some of these issues. Mm. I don't think you can teach people if you're afraid of them, mm -hmm. okay? That's very important. I mean, one of, the, one of the things I love about the African American students who come to Howard is I don't want to hear about their race. I just want to go over the problem sets. I don't want to hear any of those stories because they and they don't even bring them there. Okay. Uh, you know, it, so it's a, it's a different. We can cut down to a different level. The other thing we do in the middle school is kids come from when you look at the map, they come from all over the city. Some schools like well-behaved children. And well-behaved children will, if you look at their grades, will do better in school, okay? So we see the, the behavior that kids use in their neighborhoods, if their neighborhoods are tough neighborhoods, as a language. And we, we, we say, look, we're not asking you to give that up because you got to go home tonight. We're, you, you got that one down. Now, we're going to teach you the zero-touching one we have in the school. And it's just a question of learning another language, not giving up your language, not, not trivializing your language. Your language is essential to living in the neighborhood you live in, the circumstances you live in, okay? But you have the ability to learn another language as well, and you know when to, when, when to use which one. That's how we see it, so our kids are bilingual in that sense. They know the language of the, of the neighborhoods they're in, and they have to pass the people who are selling drugs right out in the open, on the way, and all of that. But they know when they come to school that they don't need that stuff in the school. But we do not, we do not trivialize it, and we do not tell them it's wrong to have it. We, we just basically say, OK, you, you're learning another language. And this language will help you get ahead. And, and we really go in, we talk about it real straight like that. And, uh, and it makes a difference. Really, it does. Well, okay. one of the things that we do very, I do very simply with uh, our kids, uh, when I first meet with them, our college students uh, in our program when I first meet them, I ask them a very simple question. How much can you know about an apple without eating one? Okay, well with that, I'd like to thank HUD and the Office of University Partnerships for pulling this together, and I'd like to have one more thank you for our absolutely fantastic panel. And thank you to the audience.